case you're wondering, that was not me in the video there. So one day, a, a man calls the church office. The receptionist answers the phone, and he has a real heavy West Texas accent, and he says, hey, I'd like to speak to the head hog at the trough. Well, the receptionist was a little offended and said, well, I'm not sure you're referring to our pastor, but if you are, you need to show him a little more respect. You need to call him either the reverend or, or pastor. Um, the man said, okay, okay, but um, here's the deal. I, I've got $10,000, and I was just thinking about giving it to the church building fund. The receptionist quickly responded, Hold the line. I think I see the big pig coming in the door right now. Well, today we're going to conclude the giving tree. And uh, Josh and I's prayer through this whole series has been that all of us together would learn about generosity. And the giving tree really is a beautiful, powerful picture of what generosity is to look like. Remember on that giving tree, the the root system, well, that's God. God is the source. He's the inspiration, the provider, the role model of what generosity is all about. Now, the church, that's the trunk. That's the trunk of the tree. And, and the church represents the, the place where God feeds his generosity and, and it comes up the trunk and then we're the branches and, and we go out from the trunk. By the way, a very important lesson from the giving tree is uh, where I grew up, you know, if you ever had one of those little shoots just come right out of the ground, well, you call those sucker shoots, and you know they're never going to produce fruit, so what do you do? Well, you know, you just cut those off at the ground because, you know, really the trunk is where the nourishment is coming from. That's why it's important to be plugged into the church if you're going to be a branch, unless you want to be a sucker. I don't think you want to be a sucker shoot. So you plug in, and, and so you're a branch on the tree. And so we've looked at all these parts. Well, tonight we're going to look at the last part of what the giving tree is all about, and that is on the end of you, you're the branch. Out on the end, well, that's the fruit. That's the fruit. And tonight we're going to look at the fruit, which is acts of generosity. This means that that this week, anytime you have an opportunity to give of your time or maybe your talent or maybe even your treasure, you are having an opportunity to produce the fruit of generosity. And my guess is God will give every one of us in this room, maybe small, maybe big, opportunities this week to be that fruit producing tree called the giving tree. Now, tonight, uh, and really it, we d have done it all day, as a church, we are presenting to God our three-year pledges for the building fund and uh, also our one-time offering for, we're going to start this new fund called the carpet fund. Uh, the carpet you're walking on and, the, and looking down right now, this is the original carpet in this building and this time next year, we will be 20 years old as a church. And so this carpet is getting old. So we are going to be doing what the wisdom of Solomon tells us to do and also Dave Ramsey, and that is save for the future. And so when we get to the point where we have to replace carpet, we don't want to go, oh, no, where are we going to get the money? We're going to start saving now. We like to save, have cash, pay cash, and it really works out good. So... That's what we've been doing today uh, here at Grace. As we've been involved in this process, I was reminded of a, of a definition of stewardship that I read years and years ago in a book written by a, a Christian counselor, financial counselor called, named Ron Blue, and he wrote it in the book called Master Your Money, the best book on Christian stewardship I think I've ever read. But his definition of stewardship caught my attention. Let me share it with you tonight. Stewardship is the use of God-given resources for the accomplishment of God-given 
goals. When you think of stewardship in those terms, it's rather simple. That it's God producing the resources through the tree, out the branches, and then our job is to look for those God-given needs that are out there every day and just to let God provide through us acts of generosity. Now this evening, we want to return to the text we've been focusing in on in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. A little background might help you uh, get a little more depth out of this passage. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 is, in my opinion, the greatest passage in the Bible on the topic of generosity. The Apostle Paul, at this point in his life, is collecting an offering. And he's collecting it from Gentile churches in the area that is now known as Greece. So imagine Greece, you know, that little peninsula sticking down. At the top, what used to be Macedonia, and down here was Achaia. And down in Achaia, right at the bottom, is Corinth. Paul is taking up an offering from churches in these two areas, and the offering is going to go to the Jerusalem church facing a horrible famine. They're hurting, and they're hurting big time. So Paul is taking up this offering. A year earlier, the church at Corinth had made a promise. They made a pledge to the apostle Paul. They said, okay, Paul, Next year, when you come through collecting the offering, we pledge to give this much. Well, now it's almost a year later, and it's time to go through and and take the offering. And so Paul writes 2 Corinthians to remind them and to encourage them, hey, remember your pledge. We're ready to take the offering. Now it's time not to talk about it. It's time to put it into practice and let's take the offering. Now, as branches of the giving tree, we're going to have opportunities daily, if not weekly, to produce the fruit of generosity. So here's what I want us to do tonight, and I want us to be real practical in the lesson tonight. We're challenging every Grace member, regular tender, to participate at some level in this three-year pledge. I thought it would be helpful as we begin this three-year journey to really say, okay, what is a biblical pledge? What does the Bible teach about a biblical pledge? I got to tell you, I've seen a lot of pledge programs and campaigns over the years. I'm not so sure they were biblical. I mean, there was a lot of manipulation, arm twisting, guilt tripping, and somehow that just doesn't ring true to being biblical. So, What we're going to do today is we're going to look tonight at three verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. In these three verses, I believe the Apostle Paul gives some of the most practical teaching and instruction on how do you make a biblical pledge, whether that be to your church or a relief organization or some ministry. How do you, if you're going to make a pledge, what do you need to know as you step in to that experience. All right, so let me read, first of all, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. It's verses 10, 11, and 12. Paul says this, And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. The matter is this offering they're taking up for the Jerusalem church. Last year, you, Corinthians, were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now, see we're a year later, now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it, according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. All right, let's stop and let's dig into this. If we're going to be the giving tree and do a biblical pledge, what does it take? All right, three challenges. Here's the first challenge. Give willingly. Make sure that if you're going to give and you're going to be a part of a pledge event, make sure that you give with a willing heart. Twice in these verses, Paul says it, your eager willingness to do it. And then later, for if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable. 
All right, here's my challenge for you. If you're going to give, you got to give willingly. So here is my challenge for you. Learn to give your time, talent, and treasure with a smile, not a frown. My friend, that will change your life. It's not just about, well, you know, Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I guess I better help that neighbor out. Praise Jesus. No, that, that's not the kind of gifts and generosity God wants. God wants us to give with a, a willingness, a generosity in our lives. In, in chapters 8 and 9, from beginning to end, the Apostle Paul teaches the importance of giving with a willing, a joyful, cheerful heart. The famous verse in this whole section, the most famous, is 2 Corinthians 9, 7. This is where Paul says this. Each of you should give what, look at this, what you have decided. See, not what the pastor thinks or what some church leader tells you you got to give. No, no. What you decide in your heart to give. Now, here it is. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Some of you know that word cheerful in the Greek is the word hilarion. When we get our word hilarious. God wants you to be a hilarious giver. So, you know, tonight on the way out, if you put an offering in, kind of go, whoo-hoo, you know, you chuckle. Do something. Be hilarious in your giving. What, what would happen in your life? What change would take place in your life if you learned, okay, God, from now on, whenever I give, I'm going to give with a willing, not reluctant, I'm going to give with a willing heart. Wow, that'll change your life. All right, here's the second challenge. Paul says, give systematically. Give systematically. Uh, here's what he says. Now finish the work. Remember they'd made the pledge, and now he says, now finish the work, and then later, so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your, what? Completion of it. You don't just make the pledge, but you fulfill it. How do you do that? By systematically giving all the way to the finish line. You know, a year can be a long time. The Corinthian church had made a verbal pledge a year earlier, but now it's time to pass the offering baskets. How are they going to respond? Now, in the next chapter, Paul goes into a little more detail. Kind of interesting, chapter 9, verses 1 to 5. Let me read this to you. Paul says, there is no need for me to write to you about this service, talking about the, the offering, this service to the Lord's people. For I know your eagerness to help. And I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year, you Corinthians in Achaia were ready to give. And your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. But I'm sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow, but that you may be what? Notice this. So that you may be, what's the word? Ready. So that you'll be ready. Read on. <coughs> As I said, you would be. For if any Macedonians come with me and find you, Corinthians, unprepared, we, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed of having been so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. Now, we all know the importance in sports of follow-through. It doesn't matter what sport, football, baseball, basketball, even golf. We all know what happens when you don't follow through. What happens is the ball falls short if you don't follow through. The same is true in giving. We have to follow through all the way to the finish line. So if you're going to do a biblical pledge, here's the challenge. If you make the pledge on the front end, God says, I want you to follow through when? All the way to the end. That's called 
systematic giving. What I've noticed is that, uh, that sometimes when we do like a pledge program like this, that people mistakenly think it's a financial thing. What I've learned over the years, it really isn't. It's really a spiritual thing. Uh, it's a spiritual thing. This is why making a pledge to a work of God can be one of the most valuable, spiritual, rewarding learning experiences you will ever have. Why? Because God wants to teach us discipline so we will, what, mature. You know, uh, parents, when parents teach their children, and they say, okay, it's Saturday night. Every Saturday you have to take the trash out or you don't get your allowance. Why do parents do that with children? They're teaching them discipline. So when their children grow up and they move out of the house and they have their own place and the parents go to visit their grown kids, there's not bags of trash all over the house. They go, oh, great. They learn to take out the trash. That's called maturity. They're teaching them to mature. Discipline will do that. Nothing teaches discipline like making a commitment and then following through on that commitment. I read this the other day. I got a kick out of it. Someone confessed, I have a regular time for washing my face, combing my hair, getting dressed, and brushing my teeth. However, I do not have a regular time for washing my car. And guess what? It shows. Why is it that our hair can be combed, our, our face is washed, our teeth are brushed, but our cars look like they just went through the Sahara Desert? How did that happen? Because we don't have a regular time of washing our car. It's the same with giving. That if you do not have a regular, systematic way of giving, generally what happens is the ball falls short and you really don't get around to doing it. Uh, my wife and I, what, this is the practice we use. Um, we, here at Grace, we use push pay. And so what we do at the end of every month, we add up everything that came in the front door. And so the last day of the month, we add it up. We, we're a, we tie, so we do 10% to the, to the church. And then we do a building fund pledge, and we do it at the end of every month. Uh, not three days after the end of the month. Uh, well, I've just learned on the last day of the month, that's, that's push pay day at the Hale House. And it's been amazing. This is a very important day for my wife and I, because today we have just finished the last three years pledge. We, we did our last pledge this month. And, uh, and then we're, now today we're starting another three-year pledge. We're uh, participating in the giving tree. And it just, it's so rewarding. Now, it's challenging. It's challenging because here's what I've learned is when, when, you're, when you make that pledge, the first month or two, you're pretty pumped and you're pretty excited about it. And then six months and then a year. And, and then in about two years, you're walking through the store and, and you look and you, oh man, you see this shiny new something, whatever. And you go, oh, I want that. And you start, and all of a sudden it starts calling your name. Rick, buy me, buy me. You won't be happy without me. We belong together. And I start hearing this voice. And I'm going, well, but wait, you know, my building pledge. Oh, forget the building pledge. I'm prettier. We'll have more fun together. Has that ever happened to you? Okay, it's just me that I hear voices while I'm walking through the store. Okay, I need therapy then. No, you know, that it, it's easy on the front end to make a pledge, but following through can be one of the toughest but, but most, most rewarding experiences when you go through that process. If you are making a pledge to the Giving Tree campaign today, let me tell you what you're going to discover. You're going to learn in the next three years a great spiritual lesson. And here it is. It is easier to sign a pledge card than 
a check. Oh, it's hard to sign a check. Easy to sign a pledge card on the front end, but writing that monthly check or, or hitting the push pay, you got to push it. You got to, man, it's just hard to push it after a few months, but it's so rewarding. So learn to give, Paul says, systematically. All right, here's the third challenge. You ready? Third challenge, give proportionately. Give proportionately. Paul says, you give according to your means, according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I, don't you love that? You say, okay, God, I have nothing. What should I give? God says, nothing. Give nothing. You walk by the basket, and you just kind of wave your hand over it and say, God, I give you my life. Don't have any money today, but I give you my life. And that's called being a cheerful giver. You give according to your means. I got to tell you guys, this is why the, the biblical principle of tithing is so simple and so effective. It's just giving 10% of what we make. Now, you may disagree with me, but I'm convinced the reason God did a tithe, 10% of your income, is for people who are mathematically challenged like me. Um, my math grades is what led me into ministry, okay? God knew if it was like, okay, I want you to give 7.43% of your income. I'd have to hire an accountant every month. I couldn't figure it. You realize by God saying 10%, you realize how easy it is? All you do is you move the decimal. You just jump one number and you're done. If you make $100, you jump it, Okay, I give $10. That's a tithe. If you make $500, you move $50 is your tithe. God did the tithe for me. Wasn't that nice? So I can easily know what to give. Now, let's say right now you say, whoa, man, I don't think I could ever give 10%. A lot of people used to say that. So here's the challenge is right now if you're giving like 1%, make it a goal this year to get it to 2 And then next year, try to get it to 3 and just kind of keep going up and up, and before you know it, you will be a tither. And it's really cool when that happens. Um, now, think about it. We're, we're to give according to our means. Now, think of what would happen if it were kind of the other way around. Uh, it, 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 listen to this one. Give, a uh, good quote, give according to your income, lest God makes your income according to your giving. Uh, you have to think about that. What, you know, if you're not, if, would you want God to reduce your income so that you're finally tithing? Or if, leave it up here and then say, okay, God, I'm going to work up. There's the challenge. So whatever God gives, give proportionally. Oh, one final thing. Some of you uh, have asked me over the years, say, hey, you know, I, I work on commission. How do I, how do I tithe? How do I give with commission? Uh, like I sell cars, I sell houses. There's some months I don't sell anything. What do I give that month? What is zero times 10%? Zero. So your gift is zero. Yeah, makes you feel better, get a check, put zero, sign it, turn it in. Whatever works for you. But you give according to me. No income, then you don't give that month. Next month you sell a car, you sell a house, you sell whatever, then you give accordingly. And it see it, God built it in. It's all proportionate to our income. Three great challenges from the Apostle Paul to become the giving tree. Give willingly, systematically, proportionately. This is the kind of giving that God loves, desires, and honors. Now, I want to tell a true story for someone in the room. And the someone is... The person who always feels guilty because, frankly, whenever you give a gift, your gift doesn't have a lot of zeros. It's like maybe one zero, you know, maybe it's $10, you know, I mean, it's small. And you go, man, I feel so guilty. My gift isn't worth anything. Why should I even give it at all? Okay, if that's you, if you think your gift doesn't matter, this true story is for you. It happened many, many years ago. A woman was preparing a box to be sent to missionaries in India. 
there was a child in the audience that day, and they had the box down front, and the child came up and had one penny, one penny. She put the penny in the box. That was her gift to the missionaries in India. This was back in the day when one penny would purchase this thing called penny gospel tracts. They were little bitty simple, one page, little bitty, and it folded in the middle. And it shared the gospel of Jesus, and they cost one cent. And so they took that one penny, and they bought a gospel tract, put it in the box, sent it to the missionaries in India. When the, when the box was opened, somehow, by the sovereignty of God, that little penny gospel tract landed in the hand of a Burmese chief. He read the gospel tract, was moved deeply, and committed his life to Jesus Christ. He then called together his friends and family in the village, and he shared his story of converting to Christianity with them. Many of them gave their lives to Christ. In a short period of time, they planted a church that eventually had 1,500 members. And it all started with a penny gospel tract. Actually, it started with a penny. You may not think your gift counts much, but in the hands of God, a little becomes many. It truly is amazing what God can do with a single Christian who decides, I'm going to be generous. Just imagine what God could do with a church full of people who all decide together, we're going to be, as a church, generous. Just imagine what God could do with grace. If every member of grace decided, with my time, talent, and treasure, I'm going to be generous. What could God accomplish? Well, one thing for sure, God could make us the giving tree. Let's pray. Well, Father, thank you for these challenging, encouraging, also, Lord, very practical words from the Apostle Paul. And my prayer, Lord, is that this week, would you please give each one of us, without exception, each one of us an opportunity or two to be generous with our time, our talent, our treasure, so that, Lord, we can be like you because, Lord, we are never more like you than when we give. This is our prayer through Christ. Amen.